Good morning. Welcome. Our order of worship may be found at stephensth.org slash live. There you can also find a link to this week's Children's Moment and other announcements. For those who are eager to know what our in-person gathering plans are, know that we are presently working on them. Our regathering task force is watching the infection rate and surveying the congregation to see what will be feasible for us. We will have more information on the website soon. Look for that under stephensth.org slash updates. No matter what, we're still going to be gathering digitally uh, in this place for the foreseeable future, regardless of where we go. So you, we are grateful for your presence today, and we look forward to seeing you in the future as well. Our formation class is off for the summer, but you can check out the back catalog at faith15.com. There you can learn about uh, the Eucharist and the Trinity and Pentecost uh, and what it means uh, in the most recent ones have been about human nature. So I commend all of those to you. And finally, I am grateful for our bishop's presence with us today. She will be presiding and preaching. It's going to be a lot of fun. So shortly, she'll get this the service will be a lot of fun but then we're also going to gather shortly after it on zoom for a virtual coffee hour that's going to be at 11 a.m so you can find a link to that uh, either in the comments below or at that announcement page again that is stephensth.org slash live I encourage you to join us for that and uh and have a chance to visit with the bishop herself. Now, friends, let us prepare for worship.
Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Let us sing hymn 840. Kyrie, Kyrie. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Genesis. God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moran, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac. He cut the wood from the burnt offering and set them out, and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. And on the third day Abraham looked up and saw the place far away, then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there, and we will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the word of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, son. And he said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, The Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Give light to my eyes, O God. Give light to my eyes, O God. 
How long, O oh God, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I have perplexity in my mind and grief in my heart day after day? How long shall my enemy triumph over me? Look upon me and answer me, O God, my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep in death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed, and my foes rejoice that I have fallen. But I put my trust in your mercy. My heart is joyful because of your saving help. I will sing to God for dealing with me richly. I will praise the name of God Most High. Give light to my eyes, O God. Alleluia! Alleluia, 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 The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the one holy and living God. Good morning, saints. I am so delighted to be with you this morning. I'm sorry that we're not able to gather in person in the midst of this pandemic. We are making the best of what we can do to gather and to worship and to build community and to praise God. And one day soon, I hope that we'll be able to once again come together face to face. And I know you long for that as well. I want to start today with a quote. This is from Reinhold Niebuhr. He wrote, nothing worth doing is completed in our lifetime, therefore we must be saved by hope. Nothing true or beautiful makes complete sense in any immediate context of history, therefore we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone, therefore we are saved by love. I love that quote, particularly since it seems like it's such a quote for the moment. You know, this morning, while there are so many who are doing other things than joining us for Zoom worship or wherever um, people would find nurture and sustenance for their life journey, people are doing all kinds of things. But this morning with you, I'm going to talk about faith. Not the faith that we might proclaim in the words of the Nicene Creed. You know, we'll do that. But I mean, having faith. I mean, obviously, 
Faith is an important concept in a community like ours, where we come together because we share the same faith, or at least we think we do. You know, we've we might define faith in all kinds of ways. I mean, the truth is, faith is not something that you can say, there it is right here, or say, you know, I've got it, it's all in my little box, I can put it in my backpack and I'm good. Faith is way more complicated than that, and we know it. I suspect that what really holds communities like St. Stephen's together isn't just that we share the same faith and say the same words on Sunday morning, but that we have found a home in which we can feel comfortable to ask questions about our faith, to struggle with it, to lean on others when the faith that we might want to have seems to be in short supply. We're, we want to be a part of a community that helps us to kind of work out our faith, live it out. You know, in the letter to the Hebrews, it contains the only explicit definition of faith in the Bible. I mean, you know, you can probably come through it, but I, this is the one that I know about, that, I, that I've found that's explicit. Faith is the assurance of what is hoped for and evidence of things not seen. Note that faith is defined in terms of hope here. And to illustrate this definition of faith, the author of Hebrews offers many examples from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew scriptures, and introduces the exploits of his heroes with the phrase, by faith. And so it is that we learn that by faith, Abraham left his homeland and accepted God's promise that his descendants would be many and would form a great nation. And by faith, he was willing to sacrifice his Son Isaac, trusting that God would indeed provide the sacrifice that he was ritually required to offer. And at the same time, Abraham always desired a better heavenly home and hoped for a place in God's eternal kingdom. From the examples in Hebrews 11, the following characteristics of faith emerge. The knowledge of unseen realities, generous response to God's call, faithful endurance in the face of suffering and death, and hopeful trust in God's promises. You know, I, I think I should probably in these days lean a little more on that 11th chapter of Hebrews because those characteristics are ones that I find are so helpful for this current moment. To have, you know, this generous response to God's call faithful endurance in the face of suffering and death. And we know there's so much of that, too much of that around us right now. And to be hopeful in trusting in God's promises. Faith and hope blend together against the horizon of God's kingdom. So what is the opposite of faith? Now, if I were with you, I would probably come down the aisle and I would ask you, what is the answer? What would you say? What is the opposite of faith? And maybe you know the answer I'm looking for, so I'll just give it to you. What is the opposite of faith? It is fear. The opposite of faith is fear. It isn't doubt. The opposite of faith is something a lot more pernicious, fear. And fear is a powerful thing. It can be just as powerful as faith, if not more. Because fear can be a motivator, just like faith can, but not in a good way. Fear can keep you from living your life, loving your neighbor, knowing your neighbor. Fear can keep you from being all that God calls you to be. In Matthew's gospel that we heard a few minutes ago, Jesus says to his disciples, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. And if we want our world to be different, and there's so much that I know we want our world to be different about, then we must have faith that this is true. But instead of having faith, sometimes we can be too often afraid. Afraid of the stranger, of the other, of the future, of the new circumstance. There are lots of reasons I might mention this this morning. You know, just look around. I don't have to go through the litany of what's happening in the world, on the news, in, in our neighborhoods, on our streets. There is so much fear that seems to be motivating the hatred and the bias and the suffering in this world. It is hard to live fearlessly, and yet that is what we're called to do. So I would hope that we're growing and wrestling with all of that, the way that fear can get in the way, the way that fear can take up more power in us than we would want it to. 
to take on. You know, because fear can keep us from loving and can keep us from really living. Sometimes I've talked over the past few years about my struggle with swimming. You know, some of you may know I, I didn't grow up swimming naturally. I learned, really learned as an adult in college. And, um, and I have a body that just doesn't float well, even when I have on a wetsuit, like, you know, I can kind of pop up to the top of the water, but it's always a struggle. It's like someone put concrete on my feet. But what, I come, what I've come to know, though, is that the struggle really isn't so much with the mechanics, although I could work on this arm a little bit, like I have a hard time with my reach here, but really it's mental mental and spiritual, spiritual, spiritual. It is hard for me to trust the water and believe that I'll float. When I started doing tri triathlon races, oh my gosh, back in 1998 or so first, and then I left it for a long time. The thing that kept holding me back was my fear and my fear of the water. Now I grew up around water. I grew up right on the bay in New York City, going to the beach all the time, but I never really took to it. And part of what that has meant is that no matter what I do, there's something in me that I have to consciously override in order to swim, to be able to relax, and to really, really float and be able to get across the distance of the pool or the lake. And once I learned how to swim and learned how to relax that fear, I could do it. Now I was slow, but I could do it. And it wasn't so much that my body learned how to float better, but it was really because I began to believe other people who did two things. They would tell me the stories about how they learned how to get from the edge of the pool to being able to swim easily down the lane of the pool. They would tell me those stories, but then they would also say, Jennifer, remember when you couldn't leave the edge of the pool and now you're in the middle of the lake? Like, remember the progress. I couldn't see it, but others could, and I needed them to point it out to me. And then after the telling and the retelling and the showing, I believed it, and then I swam. And I think faith is kind of like that. And you might say, okay, well, that's a nice story. Big whoop. It's just swimming. It's not life or death, right? I mean, only if you don't make it across the, the lake. It's a problem. But, but you know, the dynamic can be true in all aspects of our life as well. The same dynamic of taking a chance on hope, on believing in the possibility of something new and not yet experienced, it's the same dynamic that operates when you're trying to believe your, the water will hold you as you leave the edge of the pool to swim. Or it's the same dynamic that led Abram, the father of the faith, to believe when God said to Abram, go to a land I will show you. No maps, no name of the town or the village. Just listen to me, God said, and go. And you will have more descendants than the stars in the heavens. He said that all to a man of advanced age with a wife who was believed to be too old to bear children. And God said, now sacrifice that child for me, for my love of a quest from a loving God that we can barely fathom. There are lots of ways to interpret it, but to Abraham in that moment, he had to dig deep into a well of faith and obedience that many of us would find hard to imagine, hard to believe. And we each have our own stories kind of like that, where we conquered fear by a leap of faith. It's a faith leap that is so huge and so important because we would not be in this church, in this Zoom room, where, where we are right now without some kind of leap of faith to tell a story about how we were in one place and God brought us through to another place that we couldn't imagine, but we desperately needed to be able to see. The faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah, all of them, we name them and we remember them because they are the shorthand way of remembering what happens when you live by faith and not by fear and the amazing things that God might be wanting to do with us. Faith is not something solid that we can kind of put our hands on. It relies on memory. It relies on story sharing. It's an ongoing dialogue we have within ourselves with God and with all those we travel this life with. It's not static. And I'm hoping, dear ones, that as we move into this time of continued separation and as we begin to gather back in person, that you have had some time without the busyness that taxes us when we're doing what the old normal was, 
that maybe you've had some time to share stories of faith, to talk about what it is that St. Stephen's means for you, to talk about why you get up in the morning thanking God and what God has done in your life. And if you haven't been doing that, I invite you to find a partner in the parish or a friend or a small group and begin to sh share those stories because you don't know how your faith story might just actually be the, the story that someone else needs to hear to release their fear. When the world is kind of erupting all around us, when we can't seem to find steady ground and the foundations of everything we've built our lives on seem to be tearing apart, we need to have the voices of God and Jesus in our hearts and the voices of one another telling us, you can let go of the thing that's holding you back and trust, and we've got you. God says, I've got you. It's, it's human to worry, and it's even human to be fearful, but we can't let that space rule our lives. It's kind of like, you know, when we get stuck and the air doesn't circulate right and the Spirit of God doesn't feel really resonant to us, we need to remember that this is not the way things stay. There is another thing on the other side. If we can just trust and be freed up to get there. Here's another quote. This is from the author Frederick Buechner, who often writes about the mystery of God made known and through the events of life. He says, we understand, if we are to understand it at all, that the madness and lostness we see all around us and within us are not the last truth about the world, but only the next to the last truth. Faith is the eye of the heart, and by faith we see deep down beneath the face of things. By faith we struggle against all odds to be able to see that the world is God's creation, even so. It is he who made us and not we ourselves, made us out of his peace to live in peace, out of his light to dwell in light, out of his love to be above all things loved and loving. That is the last truth about the world. So St. Stephen's, the one who loves and created you and all that is simply desires that you have love and be loved and that you would live without fear. Do not be afraid, for it is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Amen. O oh God, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. In this challenging and uncertain time of global pandemic and public health crisis, we come before you offering our prayers on behalf of those in need, the church and the world. For the church, that it may not grow weary of proclaiming the gospel of Christ and serve as a beacon of hope to a suffering world. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Jennifer, our bishop, and all who minister in your name. Lord, in your mercy. For all affected by coronavirus around the world, for the leaders of the nations, that they may work together for the common good as the outbreak spreads. May barriers that divide be brought down that bonds of trust may be strengthened to benefit the entire human family. Lord, in your mercy. Grant public health and government officials in our nation the strength and will to act swiftly and decisively, with wisdom and compassion and service to all. We pray especially for the President, the Congress, governors, and all elected officials in our local municipalities. Lord, in your mercy. Heal those who are sick with the virus. May they have access to medical care and regain their strength and health. Grant them your healing grace. Give strength to all who are caring for loved ones. Lord, in your mercy. For health care workers who with hearts of service 
stand on the front lines of providing care. Grant them courage and protection as they put the needs of public safety before their own. Lord, in your mercy. Bless scientists and researchers around the world as they combat the virus, that their work may yield knowledge to develop a vaccine, treatments, and improved measures to reduce its spread. Lord, in your mercy. For the safety and well-being of all who travel and those who remain quarantined, Lord, in your mercy. Remove the presence of fear and anxiety from our hearts, that confident in your providence we may be generous in sharing our resources. Lord, in your mercy. Grant that our churches and communities of faith may reflect your love as they minister to the most vulnerable among us. Fill them with your Holy Spirit as they work to be your healing hands and feet to all in need. Lord, in your mercy. For those who have already lost loved ones to the virus, and those who will yet suffer such loss, that they may, be, they may know the consolation of your love. Lord, in your mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have their rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. Lord, in your mercy. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we remember today the United Church of North India and its leaders. In the Diocese of Indianapolis, we continue to pray this month for Wake Cross Camp and Conference Center, its director, camp counselors, staff, and campers. We pray also for St. George's West Terre Haute and its leaders. And we pray also for the Diocese of Brasilia, Haiti, and South Sudan. We remember in our prayers our parish neighbors, Centenary United Methodist Church, Central Presbyterian Church, United Campus Ministries, and Second Christian Church. We pray for our postulant, Joanna Benskin. And we pray for those who have asked for our prayers. Sheila Carl, Sally Newland, Ray Snyder, Linda Hegedus, Robin Rolt, Megan Price, Richard Hillier, Johnny Western, Terry Persinger, John Bonner, Lane Clark, Martha Hafner, Ellie Thomas, Mike Hayden, Jason Paradowski, Ashley Ritchie, Joe Kuhn, Justin Mendoza, and Aaron Campbell. Are there others? Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy. Sustain and support the anxious. Be with those who care for the sick and lift up all who are brought low, that we may find comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let us greet each other in the name of Christ.
Let us pray as one. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving as I proclaim your resurrection. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us say together the post-communion prayer. Lord of the feast, we thank you for gathering us as your people. We call to remembrance the many times we have been fed at your table and we lament our distance now. Be present, Lord Jesus, as you were present with your disciples. Be known to us in the breaking of bread and may your Holy Spirit sustain us in all your church until we can gather together again. We ask this for the sake of your love. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Amen.